welcome. You are going to learn to love broccoli <laughs> this week. Um, we have a very special guest who I've had the honor of getting to know, Dr. Martin Katz, who's a medical doctor, a double board certified physician in sports medicine and family medicine. He graduated from the Medical University of South Carolina, which is actually known for their brain imaging work, um, and uh, did his residency at East Tennessee State University. Um, he served the Charlottesville community for six years, but then went on to complete a sports medicine fellowship at the University of South Carolina. Um, he's worked in a variety of settings, but he has become passionate about using supplements um, to help with gut health, but also your overall health. And, you know, we often say, you know, well, what are natural ways to boost the right. brain? And immunity. So we would love if you would, at the end of this episode, uh, tell us what you've learned. It's always fun for us to hear what you've learned and maybe take a screenshot repost it, tag all of us. Um, but we just want to know what you've learned because you're going to learn a lot about broccoli. I remember how much I learned and was so, I mean, we've all heard broccoli is so great for you, right? But when I took my metabolic medicine classes, I was really surprised. We eat a ton of broccoli in this house. So, and we take supplements. And so we would love for you, for you to tell us how this was surprising to you. So. Great. So Martin, welcome to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm certainly very honored to be here. You guys are doing awesome work with the Brain Warriors Way and all the books you've written and all the extensive education you've done. I'm a huge fan of education. I'm certainly a huge believer in that's the way we're going to change this paradigm because it's fairly broken. So we got to get out there and spread the news and uh, get people doing something different because what we're doing doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, it's broken and it's getting worse. Yeah. The next pandemic that's coming is a mental health pandemic with people experiencing grief and loss and trauma. And, yeah. um, but before we get into all of that, <laughs> tell the Brain Warriors Way community sort of who you are and how you fell in love with this part of medicine. Yeah, that's, I love that story because I love uh, to talk about health and how I got there. Um, I joke with my patients that I'm, I see myself as Yoda. Um, I've sort of felt the benefits and the force of being healthy and putting a ton of effort into health. And I uh, talk to my patients about being a Padawan and learning about health and getting there. Uh, that's taken a while. Um, I was born in South Africa, um, moved over here and was uh, granted the opportunity of getting into medical school, progressed through medical school, allopathic training, um, did my residency in family medicine, um, and again, a lot more allopathic training. And what you're struck by is a couple things. One is um, a lot of people get better regardless of what we do. Um, so nature is very powerful. Um, but also, um, there's this difference between acute and chronic uh, mm -hmm. going through medical school and going through residency. And you realize that Acute care, there's no better place than America. If you're acutely injured mm -hmm. and you have acute symptoms, you're hurting, you're in pain, something's going on, you're going to do something to address that and you're going to get better and this is a good place to be. You're likely going to get better. Chronic disease, however, is a completely different thing mm -hmm. and that doesn't have symptoms initially, oftentimes. And so in my... Um, um, Years as a as a family physician, here I was adding medicines and another medicines. Now I'm confused as to the next symptom they come in with. Is this a medication side effect? Do I need to give them yet another medicine to deal with that, or is right. something else going on? And speaking of of um, mental health, one of the things that impacted me um, tremendously was this incredibly lovely lady who I would see probably every other week, once a month. And she just had a lot of depression. Um, and she eventually actually committed suicide. Mm -hmm. um, and it was heartbreaking for me because I had, you know, we had tried tons of different medicine. She, I always thought she was going to get better. 
And, you know, I was pretty struck by that. Um, and I also had a lot of patients who had these chronic illnesses who just w- weren't getting better. And again, there was 80% who were getting better, seemingly regardless of what I did. Mm-hmm. And so I was, a, I was a little confused. Quite honestly, I was a little burnt out. Um, and I love sports. So I decided to do a fellowship in sports medicine, thinking that that was going to give me a niche. Uh, I wasn't going to get to see these horribly chronic patients anymore who I had no, no idea what to do with. Um, confused by, burnt out by, et cetera, et cetera. So I went and did a sports medicine fellowship and, um, and really enjoyed it. Um, was very sports oriented, obviously, concussions and, you know, sprains and strains and injuries, acute injuries. And we dealt with those. Interestingly, coming out of it, um, I had, it was around the time I'd had my first child. And um, it seemed like a lot of the sports medicine fellowships wanted my entire life. I would you know, be in the clinic, then I'd go to sports. So I just decided to go out to Bozeman, Montana. And I worked in a community clinic. And guess what? There was a lot of mental health. There was a lot of addiction. And there was a lot of chronic disease. So here I am, you know, just finishing my fellowship and trying to niche. And I was able to offer them a lot of sports medicine. So if their patients got injured, they didn't have to pay the $200 to go see the orthopedist, which they couldn't afford, they could see me but there was still a lot of this chronic disease. And so it just really got me interested more and more in um, how I could help these people. And thanks to my parents, I wasn't super worried about having to pay off medical school. They were very helpful in helping me afford medical school or pay for medical school. So I was able to really sit with my patients and get to know them and uh, try to figure this out. And I would hear these stories of people going to possibly naturopaths or going to possibly chiropractors, all these others that had were these woo-woo doctors. You know, I'd, I'd always sort of look down at them and sort of said, well, what do they know? But they, you know, here are these people going to see them and coming back feeling better. Um, where, you know, me using my medicines or the, the tools that I had, which at that point was talking to them, sympathizing, uh, and then using a medication. <laughs> uh, wasn't really working. So, um you know, I started realizing that there was a lot more. And I started reading about nutrition and the benefits of nutrition. I started reading about exercise and the benefits of exercise and sleep and community and stress management um, and really getting a much better understanding of um, the fact that the absence of disease is not health um, and trying Mm -hmm. to help my patients understand. I love that. We should say that again. The absence absence of disease is not health. It's not health. Yeah, so, and so I talk to my patients a lot about looking under the hood. So I, I use a lot of ways to try and help my patients understand this. And so, you know, if you think about a bunch of old cars, they look beautiful. You know, we all look at them as they pass us going uh, on the, in the other direction um, or as we pass them because we're, you know, driving these far, fast cars and they're putting along. We're like, isn't that beautiful, these old cars? And so there's a line of old cars and it's at the start of a hill and there's a hill downhill and it's got some curves and you're asked to get in a car and just start going um, because it's downhill. You just put the car in neutral. You don't use your brakes much because there's curves and you, you just got to sort of modulate your speed and everybody's just cruising downhill, having fun. You know, all the cars seem the same. And that's another thing that people don't understand is in the absence of disease or as we're well, we all look the same. We don't look very different when we're healthy. But as we're cruising down, all the cars are staying sort of neck and neck, maybe jostling around. But out in the distance, there's a hill, right? You're going to start climbing up again in this hill. And you can't really see it, let's say, because of pollution, which, by the way, has gotten better as we've been driving less. But (laughs) this hill you can't see because of pollution. But you're coming up. And as you approach this hill, you've got to start accelerating. Now you really got to understand what's under that hood. How healthy is that car? How the struts, how's the um, engine mount? Is the car even have oil? How's the, does it even have gas? Um, and so you're only really going to understand how healthy you are when you hit that first uphill. And that brings us to today because here we have this pandemic mm-hmm. and we're seeing people so who have a ton of oxidative mm-hmm. stress, who have a ton of disease, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, not do as well because of all this disease. 
And so you need to understand what's under that hood because when you hit that uphill and now you're dealing with a problem or stress or what have you, you want to have the best engine. You want to have the best engine mounts, the best oil, the best gas, um, and the best conditioned car. And that doesn't happen by neglect. It doesn't happen mm-hmm. by prayer, even though prayer is helpful. I'm not bashing prayer. I love prayer. But <laughs> we, got, we got to be active in this role of understanding yes. what's under the hood. And we've Good got job. to understand what's, what's happening inside so that we can make a difference. And so that changed my course in medicine. Um, and instead of using medicines, and not to say that, that medicines are bad. I'm a, I'm a fan. There's a lot of phenomenal PhDs. Mm-hmm who are incredibly intelligent, figuring out how they can help people. I don't think they're out there to necessarily hurt people. I'm not so sure I can always say that about pharmaceutical companies, but but the people, the PhDs, I think, have the best of intentions. I have the absolute joy of working with that, with one. He is an incredible individual. He only means the best for, for people. And so, um, so my, my sort of stance on medicine, my approach to medicine changed. And now I talk to people about all these things. So if I could just validate what you're saying for a minute, because I was, um, I'm a trauma nurse, so neuro, um, so I was a um, neurosurgical ICU nurse and I worked in a level A trauma unit and I wanted nothing to do with what we called walkie talkies. (laughs) Okay. So when they could walk and talk, they needed to go somewhere else. So I saw people at the most acute phases and it's interesting. In fact, when I met Daniel and I found out he's a psychiatrist, I almost canceled our first date. I'm like, oh, dear Lord, it's like a fabulous thing and I just don't want to do it. And I yeah. was like hard charging until I became one of those people. And so it was really interesting. My own health crashed and I was put on nine medications, medications wow. to manage the side effects of medications. And I got sick when I was young at, initially. And I somehow overcame that probably because of my youth. So what you were saying about the cars made so much sense. I somehow overcame it. And I started to think that fitness equated to health. But as I became one of the patients that I'm talking about, I couldn't work in the units, the the medical units, because they were so depressing for me. It wasn't because I didn't like the people. It's because I felt helpless. I couldn't do anything to make them better. And I just felt terrible seeing when I worked in a... um, when I worked in a dialysis unit and see, like one of the patients ended up committing suicide mm-hmm. and like you're talking about, I just, it was too much for me. So I chose this other unit because I felt useful. We saw right. people get better. And so what happened after that, I don't know. And so went until I became that patient and then I went on this crazy mission to figure out, wait, I'm not doing this. I had to become my own health advocate. I'm not going to do this forever. This is crazy. I'm not, not going to be on nine medications. And so very much like your journey, I ended up taking metabolic medicine classes, um, not anti-medicine, but very much a fan of what I can do to avoid as many medications as possible and only take the ones that are necessary. So I cut my medications in half. Um, but that's when I got interested in things like sulforaphanes and supplements. Right. And um, that's when I wrote my book on nutrition and lifestyle. And it's, it's just, it's so powerful, but sometimes until it affects you, you don't really understand it. And like you said, it wasn't until I hit that uphill slope. It's when I was in my 40s that I went, or when I hit about 40 that I went, oh, wait, (laughs) this isn't so easy anymore. I can't just overcome stuff. Yeah, and we we can talk, sorry. Causing us to go uphill. Faster. Way faster. When we come back, I want to hear more, Martin, about how you went from, okay, this chronic disease thing is not satisfying and it causes burnout Mm -hmm. to where you are now. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Martin Katz. Really, to look at a different way Mm -hmm. to get and stay healthy. I'm so excited that you're with us. I mean, we're really kindred spirits on this journey. And if you didn't hear the first episode, please listen to the first episode. And at the end of this episode, tell us what you learned in the first two episodes and post. Give us a review if you wouldn't mind. Go to brainwarriorswaypodcast.com, but post what you've learned in these episodes because they're fascinating. It's just, for me, it's fascinating because it just so mirrors my own journey in healthcare. Um, But we want to know what you've learned. Maybe take a screenshot, take a photo, repost it, and tag us. Great. 
So, Martin, let's continue the discussion. So you're in Montana and your epiphany just begins to grow. I need to do something different. So continue on with the story. Yeah, so um, my so we had the one child. We got pregnant with second. Actually, my wife said, um, Montana's wonderful. It's beautiful. We have a child. We have um, our families back east. And uh, my oldest child threw up on her as she was traveling back or to, I can't remember, Bozeman. And she said, I've had enough of traveling by myself because I'd travel one way with her, but she'd stay east for two, three weeks and I could only stay for a week. So um, I made contact with a, a fitness center here on the East Coast. Um, there's a few of them, uh, pretty big sort of upscale fitness. And I started something called Wellness MD and mm-hmm. places called that ACAC. And um, I would say it was in my earlier days, it's, it's one of those things, if I knew then what I know now, mm-hmm. I would have had it worked out, it would have worked out probably differently. But it was a great experience. I got to work with incredible personal trainers, nutritionists, people who were really interested in moving people's health. Um, and so we started a diet program, medically supervised weight loss program. This is when I still believed in weight loss. Not that weight loss is bad, but it's not what we need to be focused on. Right. And so, um, but I was pretty focused on it because it seemed like a good thing to do. And it was a catchphrase and we were all doing it. And so, you know, in building that program, just learned a lot about uh, nutrition, exercise, and all the things we spoke about earlier, sleep, and how they impacted health. I mean, if, you know, what's amazing to me in today's days, you know, you get these physicians, I will refer to a general surgeon or to a hematologist oncologist, and they'll say, it doesn't matter what you eat, or it doesn't matter what you put into your system. And it blows my mind yes. because, well, I mean, they're using medicines. Where do they think the medicines are being metabolized and processed? Right. And so it absolutely matters. And it abso- And if they would just take the time to start reading the literature, which, you know, they are, they do, we don't have time. We don't have a lot of time. You are so busy with medicine now, electronic medical records, blah, blah, blah. And we have these drug reps that are coming in and telling us what we should be doing. And we don't have broccoli drug reps because, you know, <laughs> there's no money there. We don't have sulfurophane drug reps. We don't have, um, you know, all curcumin, you know, all the different incredible polyphenols and uh, isothiocyanates and all that. They're not represented. And so these, you know, doctors <laughs> don't. That's actually necessarily- hysterical. Right. It's so yeah. true. It's yeah. so true. And most doctors you know, when I was in medical school, so I think half of the illnesses I see as a psychiatrist are related to the bad food right. people eat. And yet of the 80,000 hours it took me to become a physician, 16 of those. Was <laughs> to you got trade. 16 hours. That's a lot. It, it was because I went to yeah. a very forward thinking medical school, but <laughs> it's, it's just insane that people don't think food matters. And you know they don't think food matters because when my parents were in the hospital, they fed them like they were trying to kill them. And (laughs) And waking them up throughout the night. Absolutely. So I worked in an ICU unit and we called it ICU psychosis. So the only time we called psychiatrists, we didn't really want to, but we called them when we needed to knock our patients out in spite of all of the beeps and the alarms and waking, you know, opening their eyes to check their pupils, but we needed them out because they would wake up with psychosis. And so um, we're waking them up all the time. But I also went to a very forward thinking school who wouldn't let you have some of these foods that we talk about now. And I thought they were crazy. I would bring my own lunch bag and the huge thing of coffee because I'm like, these people are nuts. They're nuts right. that they're not letting us eat junk food. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's but amazing. they actually had a point. And these people were very healthy. It was in one of the blue zones. And so I'd see these 100-year-old people coming in, 98, 100 years old, that were their Seventh-day Adventist. Now, yeah. I'm not Seventh-day Adventist, but I started to think there's something to this lifestyle thing. Because as these people started to come in, they were on, it was their, it was their first major medical issue. They were mm. on no medications or maybe one medication which was weird because the surrounding towns, the people from the surrounding towns would come in train wrecks. And so I'm like, what, this is weird. They had no lines in their faces. And I'm like, something's got to be going on. And it started triggering my own interest in nutrition. 
And so that was sort of my journey. And plus it didn't hurt that I got, had my own health, major health crisis. So we need to get to broccoli because I promise yeah. people when we started this week, we're going to talk <laughs> about broccoli and they're going to fall in love with broccoli uh, as opposed to what the first president Bush, would he say? I'm president. I don't have to eat broccoli. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you don't have to eat it. You should want to eat it. <laughs> so how did the interest in sulforaphanes come about? So that's a great question. You know, I'd say up probably four or five years ago was not a molecule I'd actually heard of. Um, you know, I'd heard of curcumin and I heard of, you know, a lot of the gal galaic acids and all the other isocyanates, uh, I3C and, you know, uh, the like. But I had not really studied or even actually heard about sulforaphane. So the story starts actually a little bit of a sad note uh, with a beautiful young lady by the name of Mara. And uh, she um, came to me, I took over her care when she had developed metastatic breast cancer um, over time. She, um, she was in a lot of pain. She had metas metastases, I think, to her liver and bones at the time. So she was in a, quite a bit of pain. She had a fair amount of um, nausea, vomiting, so limited appetite. And I met her husband, who's one of the partners in, in Broccoli. Um, and um, they were working with a PhD guy because she was now past chemotherapy. That wasn't going to be beneficial. She was receiving some radiation therapy, but it was their choice to treat it more or to try and manage it more naturally. And uh, we had the opportunity at that point to um, uh, biopsy one of the lesions to make sure that's what it was. And being a physician, I knew the interventional radiologist real well. And I said, hey, guys, by the way, is there any chance that I could get some of that tissue? I have, I know a guy, this PhD guy that I was telling you about. I know this guy who can do something with those cells. And they said, sure. So, you know, uh, we were able to obtain those cells. We grew those cells. And then what we did is we subjected those cells to a bunch of nutraceuticals, or John did. And one of them was sulforaphane, which, again, I had not really heard about. Uh, come to find out sulforaphane was incredibly beneficial in a good way for her cells. So this is where the journey started. So we understood that broccoli actually is not very high in sulforaphane. Actually, broccoli sprouts are incredibly right. high in sulforaphane, about 100 times more high than broccoli, the mature plant. And so we started growing broccoli sprouts for her um, and then juicing them. And if you've ever done that, you realize it's got <laughs> quite a taste. Yeah. Um, it's fairly pungent. It's a strong taste. If you want to try it, go for it, um, but just realize <laughs> it has a taste. Um, and so we were trying to put it with lemon juice so she would tolerate it. But, you know, she would get to maybe a quarter of it and either throw up or be like, I'm done. And David, to say the least, is an exhaustive guy. Um, and so he started looking at different options and we went and he went out and looked at different supplements. Um, and then he read a study that showed that the supplements, unfortunately, don't provide very much um, of the sulforaphane that he was looking at. Uh, they are, I'm not, you know, saying that's true of all broccoli supplement, not broccoli, sulforaphane or glucoraphanin supplements, uh, but certainly the ones that he was looking at. And so um, we charged ourselves or charged John, really with coming up with a way to stabilize sulforaphane. It's quite an unstable molecule. Um, and so uh, John started playing with it in, in his little lab. And um, I don't remember how long it took him, but he eventually figured out how to stabilize sulforaphane. And so we we're the first American company. There's a French company that has done it. It's a little bit of a different process. There is more, there is more chemical. Ours is a perfectly natural process where we have been able to now stabilize sulforaphane. The interesting thing about that, if you read about and learn about sulforaphane, is it's actually a fairly small molecule, and it's a, it's a lipophilic molecule, which means it gets into the body very well. So as opposed to these um, precursor molecules, and I'll, I can explain this a little bit more, uh, when you chew broccoli or broccoli sprouts, where it's really high, you release these precursor molecules. One is called glucoraphanin. Um, in a lot of these supplements, it's referred to as sulforaphane glycosinolate, which is mm -hmm. very, very confusing. And 
again, very frustrating with the supplement company that there's so much confusion out there, but it is really glucoraphanin. It is a gluco glucosinolate, but it, it's, it's not sulfurophane. Um, it's a precursor molecule. And when you chew the broccoli sprout, you release an enzyme called myrosinase. The two will combine myrosinase and uh, glucoraphanin to form sulfurophane, which is very bioavailable. And so when you're looking at supplements, which is something we're very interested in bringing best supplement to market, you got to make sure that it has biologic activity and that it's biologically right. available, right? So when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the published research on sulforaphanes and how they may help you. So what, what did you learn during this episode? Post it on any of your social media sites and uh, hashtag Brain Warriors Way podcast. That would be great. You can also leave a question, a comment, or review at brainwarriorswaypodcast.com. We'll enter you into a raffle to win one of Tana's books or my new book, The End of Mental Illness. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're here with our friend, Dr. Martin Katz. Everything you want to know about sulforaphanes and how you can use them to, you know, is one of the things to stay healthy. Um, I always love natural ways to heal the brain, natural yeah. ways to heal the body. One of my grandbabies um, that we've talked about, Emmy, has had developmental challenges. And sulforaphanes is actually one of the strategies mm -hmm. that her functional medicine doctor has used and has actually helped her with learning. And there's a number of studies with sulforaphanes and the brain. But Martin, maybe you can review for us, what does this science say about how sulforaphanes work and how might they help someone? Yeah, I mean, the science is tremendous. You know, <clears throat> sulforaphane came about um, through Johns Hopkins. It was uh, founded by Lucian Zhang, Lucian Zhang and Paul Talley back in 1992. And those guys were actually looking at uh, inducers of cancer. And since that time, there's hundreds and hundreds of studies published on sulforaphane every year, um, you know, gradually ramped up. I think last year there was something like 250 or two years ago, there was something like 250 studies on sulforaphane. So the science is rich um, on sulforaphane. And it's a remarkable molecule in that it's actually a little bit pro-oxidant. So it actually stresses the cell to right. a certain degree, mm -hmm. which people don't really understand. It's not in and of itself the antioxidant. It's working on upstream problems. And so, you know, we have, uh, again, this, this idea of treating symptoms and here's a med for this and here's a med for this. But what would be great is if we could start focusing on something that has upstream mm -hmm. capabilities. And a word that I absolutely love is something called pleiotropic. Um, because, you know, people come in with so many different things. I'm not sure exactly, you know, what they should or shouldn't be taking. And so if there's a molecule that creates a pleiotropic effect, I'm pretty excited about it. And pleiotropic means this one molecule, sulforaphane, has a a big impact. And the way it has a big impact when you ingest it, and again, it's very bioavailable, so it gets across the gut, it's getting into tissues, they found it in breast tissue, uh, it gets across the blood brain barrier, it's getting into brain, and as you pointed out, it helps uh, people with a, a significant amount of brain uh, issues, including depression and degenerative brain disorders. Um, great study on autism. Um, but this molecule sulforaphane turns on something called NRF2. Um, now, NRF2 is yet another molecule that goes down to your nucleus and turns on something called the antioxidant response element, which is 
Some people have estimated at the very least 200 genes, but possibly as many as 500 genes that are instrumental in decreasing uh, your oxidative stress. And we can talk a little bit about oxidative stress. It's very, very important to understand oxidative stress. It helps with detox. We know we are living in a very toxic world. Um, you know, just getting out in LA and breathing uh, is a risk factor. Um, New York, um, you know, Shanghai, all these big cities, uh, lots of pollution problems. Great study on sulfurophane as it happens. And um, decrease in benzene and acrolein, which are big, uh, big in uh, pol uh, pollution. Um, but anyway, so this antioxidant response element turns on all these genes that have a lot to do, again, as I mentioned, antioxidation, detoxification, anti-inflammation. So we know about inflammation and in the brain and, you know, joints and uh, the pancreas and you name it. And, um, and then also with immune modulation response, which is a huge thing now with this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so there's some studies that suggest that sulfurophane has a has an impact on natural killer cells helping not only what's called the innate immune system, which is there, it's not very specific, it's going to help you deal with things up front, uh, but also the adaptive immune system. Um, and so it's, it's a molecule that is vastly studied, and has just so much um, data behind it with with regard to all these disease processes which are making us sick if i could ask you um one of the ways i was trying to explain to the kids because they're like why are vegetables good for me why do i have to eat them especially the dark green leafy ones which kids don't like and i was trying to explain it to them and one of the ways it was explained to me is um okay let me let me make this easy for you um tell me if this is too simplified or if you can add some into this they're good for you because they're a little bit bad for you meaning that <laughs> they do put that little bit of stress on the cell, which causes your immune system to kick in. It causes you to fight all these bad things. So that's way oversimplified. But when, it, but it causes a stimulative process to start kicking in. And so it's like this this idea of hormesis almost. It's like when you when you ingest something that's a little bit like greens have a little bit of that that toxic effect. It causes your body to go wait whoa let's be you know let's be on alert and it decreases inflammation and fights back. Now, is that over, I mean, I know that's probably way oversimplified, but is that sort of the idea of what happens? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that there are uh, molecules in plants that are hormetic, and that's what right. you're describing. Hormesis, uh, my, my favorite example of hormesis is exercise. So exercise, we all know, doesn't feel great, right? right. It hurts, but we all feel better after doing it. Why? Right. Because it's a hormetic stress. It brings out the best in our cells by stressing them. So it creates... Mm -hmm. Uh, mitophagy, we all love or should love the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. um, and so exercise, yeah. right, it's what creates energy, but so much more. Um, and so this mitochondria uh, with exercise can undergo changes. If there's a lot of ex oxidative stress, the mitochondria is not very healthy. Mm -hmm. And there are some studies showing sulfurophane supporting the health of the mitochondria. But if the mitochondria is not healthy, it's leaking oxygen. It's mm -hmm. leaking things. Um, that whole oxidative phosphorylation process, which gets you that energy, is being broken down because you're not able to hold those electrons in place. Those electrons escape. And guess who loves electrons? Oxygen. It's mm -hmm. kind of, I talk to my kids and my patients even about the Hulk. Most people know who the right. Hulk is. And so it's like Dr. Banner and the Hulk. Oxygen as a compound is, the, is Dr. Banner. It's generally relaxed. It's not getting excited. But if it finds electrons, which it really likes, it becomes the Hulk. And what does the Hulk do? The Hulk smashes. Right. It breaks down that cellular wall. It breaks down, um, you know, God forbid, DNA, that very mm -hmm. thing that drives cell processing. So it's not good. And so it's funny you, you mention this. And again, I'm, this is a selfless plug. I actually wrote a kid's book. Um, I haven't oh, gotten to publish yet. I've put it out to publishers. I haven't got anybody interested. Oh, it's fantastic. Okay. Yeah, it's called You Are Incredibly Awesome. <laughs> Except um, I've left out the vowels. <laughs> so it's why, you know, R, R, just the R and then incredibly right. leaves out the I's and the E's. And um, I, I do the, and so as you go through the book, each of those vowels are vegetables and fruits oh, and they help nice. fill in the words. And so by the end of the book, I think it's O or U, I can't remember what my last vowel is, you get the full sentence. 
I um, see. Yeah. And the front cover, you know, if you hold it different ways, you see it's you are incredibly awesome. But if you're just looking at it, it makes no sense because it's just a Y, the next word, just an R, and then N, C, R. Oh, you have to send it. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. You have to send yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I, I started talking to my kids. Through. I started talking to my kids about gardens and about uh, composting and making sure that you're putting the best in. You're not going to put a Snickers bar in. You're going to put Right. <laughs> and I was trying to think of these ways to help explain to my kids. Um, why they want to eat healthy because telling them to eat vegetables no, and it fruits, work. it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so if you have a cool story, so I, I'm a part of this endurance team at Miller's at this local school, uh, incredible endurance team. Uh, when they show up, people know it's for real. They're, they're very, very good. And they're very interested in all things, nutrition. And these are teenagers in, in high school. And so they're a little ahead and they want to be the best. And so I go in there and talk to them and I'll ask one kid on one side of the room to tell a kid on the other side of the room something, but he tells me and I write it down without the vowels and the guy on the other side of the room has to figure it out. And, the, and, and it has to do with communication. And why that is so important is because our cells are communicating all the time. We are a system. And if there's a breakdown in that communication, if there's a breakdown in that system, it's not going to be as healthy. It's not going to be right. thriving as much. And so that's this important idea of oxidative stress. Oxidative stress, which comes from, again, oxygen and this oxidative phosphorylation, this mitochondrial um, production of energy, which is unbelievably important. But the other thing that I did not get in medical school was that it's also creating these byproducts, these mm -hmm. um, OH minuses, these, o, these oxygen radicals, these uh, superoxide radicals, hydrogen peroxide, which actually communicate and signal if there's a problem. Now, within the cell, you have incredible antioxidants. Most of us probably have heard of glutathione. Mm -hmm. um, it's produced within the cell. There's others. There's lots of others. Uh, hemoxygenase, NQO1. Uh, superoxide dismutase catalyst. These are all big words, but suffice it to say, they help to normalize or help to decrease that oxidative stress if you don't need to signal that the cell's in trouble. But if the cell's in trouble, if there's a virus or bacteria, or you just lacerated, you just caused a cut, and now you're bleeding out and you need to say, hey, I need help out here, or God forbid you had a heart attack because you weren't that healthy, you need to signal your cells to come and repair. Right. And that cell signaling happens because of oxidative stress. So it's very important, but it's also, you've got to understand that it's incredibly important that you balance it because if you don't, you're going to land up with disease. And sort of like inflammation. It's, it's necessary, it's, but not all the time. <laughs> exactly. And that's the difference between acute and chronic disease. Right. Chronic disease is just letting this process go on and on. Right. And so, you know, I mean, Lord, I have smokers who come into my office This talking about the absence of disease um, is not health. I have smokers who come into my office and say, hey, I'm healthy. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you're not. Let I know. They, it's so you're funny when I hear people say poison. that. Yeah, and that's why yeah. the scans we do are so helpful because yeah. you can see the damage they're doing to their brain. It's really hard to be healthy when you have a damaged brain. When we come back, I want, to just, I want us just to summarize sulforaphanes and when someone would think about broccoli uh, and adding it to their regimen. So what did you learn during this podcast? Um, write it down, take a picture of it, post it on any of your social media sites, hashtag Brain Warriors Way podcast. Also leave us comments, questions, reviews will enter you into a uh, drawing for one of Tana's cookbooks or uh, the end of mental illness. You can do that at brainwarriorswaypodcast.com. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are here 
with our friend, Dr. Martin Katz. We're having a great discussion about functional medicine, but specifically helping you learn about the power of sulforaphanes, which has great research and helps with detoxification and decreasing inflammation. And we're going to talk in this podcast about when should you consider adding it to your supplement regimen? Yeah, this is so much fun for me because you're speaking my language now and I get super excited about all the <laughs> nutrients and nutraceuticals. Um, so please, if you have learned anything or you found anything really helpful, um, write, write to us, brainwarriorsway.com at brainwarriorswaypodcast.com. And you can take a screenshot. You can post it on social media, tag us. You can tag us at Brain Warriors Way Podcast. You can tag us individually. But we want to hear from you because that's like our joy that when we get these comments from you and we know what you're learning, we would love for you to leave us reviews. And we love your questions and comments because when you send them to us and we answer them, it enters you into a drawing for either my cookbook or your book, The End of Mental Illness. Great. All right, Martin, let's make this really simple and practical for people. Okay. When should they think of adding this to their regimen? What are, and we always talk about how supplements don't treat diseases. What they do is they support the processes in your health. So we have supplements that support mood, that support focus, that support memory. I one way that I think about this for when people ask me about it, it's like it mines the gap. But one thing I like to think about is when I was in the ICU, we, you know, we're always doing things to quickly put bandages over bullet holes, right? Because we have to. It's like well, we're putting a bandage over, right? Holes. But but it's a great analogy. <laughs> we're putting bandages over bullet holes. Whereas when you have the time to educate people and make sure they stay out of those situations, you're preventing it. You're keeping them healthy. And so I think of, of supplements and lifestyle and food and, and all these things, these nutraceuticals, as how we prevent the bullet hole to begin with or how we heal it from the inside out so that we can take that bandage off, which isn't going to hold. So we remove the bandage that's not going to hold very long by healing it from the inside out, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. <clears throat> what I would say is that, you know, a couple of things. I'd like to just add that, what, you know, you show up to a lot of these conferences, sometimes you show up to these conferences and you're speaking to the choir already or you're singing to the choir already. And so what I would say is if, yeah, <laughs> exactly, Tana. Um, if what you're hearing is not news to you, please forward it to others who, you're, who you love, your loved ones, if you feel like they can get something out of it. Because the more people hear about this, the more people understand that they need to be taking care of their health, the bigger and better the chance that we can have a paradigm shift in chronic health care. Um, if I could have management. one thing before you go on, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you asked sure. me a really important question before we started the podcast. And you said, how is it that you decided this was so important and you got started? It's so hard to get patients to understand sometimes what made you take your health so seriously that you just like went on this journey. And it's, that's the thing if we could get people to understand. And for me, when you ask that question, it, my answer to you, and what I'm hoping that people listening will understand if they're not feeling well, whether it's depression from the pandemic or inflammation and you're tired or whatever it is, the thing that got me going was being on nine medications. I would rather take 30 supplements that don't have side effects than nine medications that made me feel awful. So that's what made me go on the journey was take feeling terrible enough. And wanting to be off of those medications that had side effects. So for to answer, like to join in with what you're saying, for right. people who are listening, when it, like if you know this, that's great. But if you don't and you're listening, why would you do this? Because you're you don't feel good and there's another way. So it doesn't mean you're gonna get off of all your medications. I didn't. I'll be on medications for the rest of my life and I'm grateful for them. But there's a I don't need to be on nine of them. <laughs> so with all these side effects, right? right. Yeah, so what I would say, um, there's a couple things I'd like to say. Um, if you're doing, if you feel like you're doing everything right, you're eating really well, and not just broccoli, but the, from the isothiocyanate family, or what's called the cruciferous family, so that's bok choy and kohlrabi and wasabi and uh, cabbage and broccoli and broccoli sprouts and Brussels sprouts and you name it, and you're eating a variety of foods, 
Um, and again, I'm diet, diet agnostic. I don't prescribe to any one medicate, any one type of diet. I'm a big fan of understanding what's good for you and what's good for you is going to be different. What's good for your neighbor. So don't just listen to be intentional about yourself so that you're bringing best health to yourself. So if you're eating really well, you're exercising, you're sleeping well, you have limited stress or you're managing your stress well, or you've got a great community and you're feeling great, do you need to be taking self thing? I don't know. But if you're not doing those things or you're struggling or you're not feeling well, it brings about Dean Ornish's idea of the kitchen sink. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that, but I absolutely love this analogy and I've taken it because I just love it so much. And so Dean Ornish said that, um, he was talking about cardiovascular disease. And he said that in this country, the taps are on, the plug is in, the, the, the sink is filling up and it's overflowing. And what we do in this country is we're looking for the best mops, the best towels, the mm-hmm. best sponges, and we're trying to mop up that mess. It's not the answer, people. Switch off the faucet. Stop allowing all this, uh, all this toxins and all the stress into your system and pull up the plug, <laughs> allow it to go out. And, and what the way I take it further is, yeah, we still got the faucets on, but the problem, what we don't realize is we haven't intentionally stopped up the sink. We haven't intentionally plugged it up. It's happens over time because of this oxidative stress, because of inflammation, because our immune system is not working as well. This, because our cells are losing identity, uh, <clears throat> and, and we're, David Sinclair's work with the whole sirtuins, so our cells are losing identity. We've done really cool studies on something called glyphosate and gap junctions, and glyphosates happen to disrupt gap junctions, and these gap junctions are really cool little proteins that are intercellular. They go between cells, and they're, they're communicating, and there's six different proteins and they're different depending on what organ you're looking at. So it's likely that these cells are developing uh, their identification through these gap junctions. So I always wonder if I cut myself, how does, how does my skin know to grow back? How does that identify skin? And it's possibly through sirtuins. It's possibly through gap junctions. We don't absolutely know. But gl- again, glyphosate disrupts that uh, and, and has an effect on the cell in many different ways. It also breaks the, the gut and we don't have to get into glyphosate, but it's certainly a toxin. But all these toxins are plugging up the sink. And again, not intentionally. We go to the grocery store, we get what we need. We're living in these hygiene hypothesis areas. So our microbiome's not as good. Um, you know, there's so many, and, and we go into hotels and there's all these flame retardants. I mean, it's just, you go on and on. Plus, we're stressed out about, you know, do we have enough money? You know, now, how are we going to deal with our kids who are at home? Because I, you know, I'm, you know, they're not at school anymore. I need to work, blah, blah, blah. So there's all these ongoing stresses that unfortunately create an oxidative load, this glucocorticoid load. Uh, another book that I've enjoyed reading is Why, don't, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, mm-hmm. um, which yeah, sort of talks about, book. yeah, which sort of talks about this ongoing stress. And so here we are adding everything to the sink and the kitchen sink and the, the plugs are, and the taps are on. And so when I start talking to my patients and I just, some, some of them, you know, Daniel, you know this and Tana, you know this, you look at them, you're like, oh, I don't know, you look like you're a metabolic syndrome risk or, you know, or you, you look at smokers and their skin's just not as healthy and, you know, they're starting to have clubbing of their fingers. You can just look at these people, they don't look as healthy. Or, you know, you get some lab work and you see that their LDL oxidized is a little bit higher or their C-reactive protein is a little high. And you just realize that their system is not as good or they come in and they're 42 and they look like they're 52. So there's this idea about chronological age versus biological age. And that's where I see stuff. We only have a minute. Oh, Uh, sorry. So so (laughs) let's summer it. So if you are struggling with feeling fatigue, if you're in a toxic environment or now in a pandemic, I think our baseline stress for all of us has gone up about 30%. Yeah. That, that can be helpful. Um, h- how else? If you just okay. had to give me a list of okay. like five things that would help me know that this would be helpful and then for people that are interested, they can go to broccoli 
dot com forward slash Amen, A-M-E-N, and learn more about it. But can you just give me that quick summary in just like five words? Five words. Wow. So, um, you know, again, if you're if you have inflammation and dealing with inflammation, so furafine is going to be excellent because it's so going like to help pain you. would be a, pain would be a symptom, right? Pain would be, but again, that's the thing is we have got to get away from this idea of treating acute symptoms because now it's too late. Right. You don't want to wait for pain. We got to realize we got to look under the hood and realize that there's other things that are happening. We're slowly clogging up, clogging up the strain. Okay. We don't want to wait till it's end to to be clogged because it's going to overflow then. We mm-hmm. want to get to it and slowly decrease it so our cells can work optimally. So mm-hmm. we can get, so we can balance the oxidative stress, which sulfurophane does so beautifully. It is the most powerful turn on of NRF2, which is just so instrumental in helping us increase glutathione, all these oxidative stress. It helps to decrease inflammation through NF kappa B. So again, brain health, uh, joint health, you name it, we see it. And, and one of the things we hear a lot is people just say, I'm, I'm thinking more clearly because it's allowing the system to clean up. You're burning more cl- uh, cleanly and you're, and so your cells are now more healthy. Uh, so I would say it's hard for me to not want everybody on sulfurophane, quite honestly, because we mm-hmm. do live in a very toxic world. And mm-hmm. quite honestly, I'm not sure why more people don't know about sulfurophane. And part of the reason we're trying to get out there and educate people, just because it's such a powerful molecule with so many resounding studies behind it. And for that matter, there's thousands of studies on NRF2, which again, broccoli is the most powerful natural supplement to turn on. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Martin Katz. And I could just go on and on and talk about this. I get so excited. But. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's, I think, why I fell in love with you. I know. I'm kind of a nerd. A pretty redhead <laughs> that knows about sulfur veins and was so excited. Yeah. I don't go to concerts. I go to podcast. seminars. So what did you learn during this podcast? Write it down. Post it. Write it down. Take a picture. Post it on any of your social media sites. Leave us comments, questions, or reviews at brainwarriorswaypodcast.com. We'll enter you into a raffle. Um, And if we answer one of your questions on the podcast, you will win. So um, we just hope all of you stay safe during this weird, challenging time. And Martin, thank you so much for being with us on the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Yeah, it was really great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Just wonderful. Thanks for all you guys do as well. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're considering coming to Amen Clinics or trying some of the brain healthy supplements from BrainMD, you can use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com or a 10% discount on all supplements at brainmdhealth.com. For more information, give us a call at 855 978-1363.